uh, my normal job. So I'm a full stack web and, and mobile app developer, but also in my role as, as uh, head of engineering, I do a lot of technical coaching and also personal mentoring, um, which is basically where a lot of the experience that, that formed this talk comes from. And I'm also a really big cyclist and music fan. Just to quickly touch on Next Jump, where I work, um, we are an e commerce tech company. We're kind of like Amazon for employees. So there are two main parts of our business. There's perks at work. Um, so we work with 70% um, of the Fortune 1000. There's a couple of organization logos there. Oracle actually is one of them. Uh, they probably know perks at work. Uh, um, so that's on that side. And on the other side, we're actually uh, a social movement. Um, so we try to work with organizations to help them improve their cultures internally. And so we work with a whole bunch of organizations from the Ministry of Justice, uh, the US Air Force, US Navy, and, and Apple. Uh, amongst others. Um, there's also been a, a Harvard, uh, wrote a book about us a couple of years ago, um, which is quite interesting, called An Everyone Culture, um, which discusses a bit more about Next Jump. So uh, ego has a bunch of different ways to be interpreted. So I'm just going to put out what my, how, I, how I'm interpreting this. Um, so we're on the same page to start off with, especially in different contexts. So I'm going to list some of the symptoms that I feel uh, make up an ego culture. One of them is a, a fear of speaking up. Fear of you know, speaking up to your manager, speaking the truth around other people, um, up to your bosses. There's very few people making decisions. Um, often it's quite centralized with one or two senior decision makers and most people just executing. People tend to act quite selfishly. Low calorie feedback. I'll go a bit more into that later on. Um, a big one is not my problem. So people tend to pass the buck. No one really wants to uh, take ownership of problems and they tend to ask other people to do it. Lying, hiding, faking, this is a really big one. Uh, sometimes this is called your second job at work because you're spending so much time almost hiding the truth, you know, kind of manipulating it, all sorts of different things uh, because you're trying to maintain a certain uh, outward exterior to other people. And at a higher level, organizational silence. And what I mean by this is the organization isn't really speaking the truth internally. And uh, this ego culture actually is a culture of low truth. That's another way of interpreting that. And how this may actually feel uh, if you're someone in this is essentially you're walking on eggshells. You're walking very delicately around the place, trying not to upset anyone. You're trying not to you know, rock the cart. You're trying not to crack the eggshells. So um, this is how I feel when, I'm, when I feel that. I know I'm in a sort of situation where my ego is kind of under threat. So I want to bring this to a, a real life example. Um, and I think a really good one that brings it in is the Columbia disaster in 2003. Um, some of you may be aware. Um, the space shuttle exploded um, when it was coming back into Earth. What was really interesting about this uh, accident is it was preventable. So there was a NASA engineer who spotted a piece of foam coming off the side of the shuttle and hitting uh, one of the rocket boosters. But in a meeting uh, later on, he felt like he couldn't speak up uh, to his senior manager, uh, because her manager's in the room. There's a quote from him here actually saying, I just couldn't do it. She was way up here and I was way down here. And he uses his hand to kind of signify that. So he felt uncomfortable speaking up in front of all these senior people. He felt very threatened and he couldn't say the truth. And in the report that came out afterwards of this disaster, um, I've put a little quote in it here because I think it's really good. The board presents its view that NASA's organizational culture had as much to do with this accident as the foam did. So I think this is a really powerful example of just how important culture is to the success or failure uh, of, a, of a project. So we may not all be sending rockets uh, up into space or, or these kind of things, but we certainly are all working for organizations where we're trying to achieve something, trying to achieve a goal. And so why is this, why is this talk even important to you? Um, is, you know, is ego not just a, an HR problem? Why should I care about it as a developer? Um, really it affects all of us. So I mentioned earlier, ego culture is about a lack of truth. And if you have a lack of truth, you're not going to make good decisions. And if you're not making good decisions, you're going to fail, essentially. So this is kind of my central uh, thesis of the whole talk. So what I mean by uh, the truth? So I'm going to give you a, a, a metaphor here. Imagine you're a a Navy, you know, submariner, and you're looking at a sonar screen, and you're trying to figure out what's outside that submarine. You know, there could be enemy ships, there could be, you know, icebergs, it could be all sorts of threats, and you can't really tell what's out there, but you need to find it so you can navigate yourself through it. 
So what you do is you send out these signals and you then get feedback from things bouncing off uh, these different things. And that informs uh, your picture of what's happening. So in this case, feedback, literally the bounce is coming back or a proxy or approximation of the truth. It's not actually, you can't literally see it, but it's a good enough proxy for the truth. So I'm gonna talk a lot more about feedback in a second, but essentially, if we can get to a place where we're giving more feedback, it'll help us get to a place where we're talking, we're getting the truth much more, which will lead us to making better decisions and succeeding and all that kind of stuff. So there's examples of this, you know, you could be putting out a point of view on, a, on some sort of leadership decision or some kind of product that you're making or some feature you're suggesting, or you could even be, you know, trying on new clothes and you wanna get feedback from your partner if you look bad in them. Um, you know, that's all kind of feedback to get the truth. So, uh, next jump, um, feedback really is baked into our culture um, and why this is important for us. So I'm going to continue the Navy metaphor here for a second, uh, if, you, if you'll let me. So the U.S. Navy, the guys who land on the aircraft carriers, is an incredibly difficult job. These guys are under a huge amount of pressure, and they're also extremely high performing. So any of the best pilots get to do this job. But what's really interesting is at the end of these uh, flights that they do, when they land and they, they all kind of meet up afterwards, to do a full 360 and each member of the, each person stands up in turn and everyone in that group, no matter what their rank or, or uh, ability gives feedback to that person about that landing. Um, so it's a full 360 feedback. It's very honest. Um, people are very candid with each other. But the important part here is they all care about each other. You know, they're not just ripping into this guy. They all want to have a successful mission. They want to have a successful flight. They don't want them to crash. Um, so feedback um, is really baked into their culture. And I really think if you want to have a high performing culture, feedback is super critical. So a lot of us have kind of, you think about feedback, I think there's a bunch of misnomers around feedback. Um, this is my point of view, you know, it's up for discussion later on um, about is and is not feedback. I think one example where I've seen feedback being quite poor is uh, sort of people saying, well, John, well done, good job, isn't particularly useful. Another place where feedback can go wrong is when it's only tied to compensation or, or performance reviews. So if you only find out once a year, you know, actually you weren't doing very well, the rest of the team thought you, you know, didn't really contribute or you're a bit of a, you don't speak up or you speak up too much. You want to find that out a lot sooner than in that one sort of high pressure performance review. So feedback really should be given very frequently, ideally ritualized. Um, but also it should be used mainly as a thing to steer your growth and direction, not particularly for actual performance reviews. Another really interesting thing we can talk about later as well is I think the anonymity of feedback can be really important. If uh, you know who's giving you feedback, you can often dismiss it because you know who they are. You think, oh, you know, they always say that about me. But if you have a group of people anonymously saying the same thing, there probably is a grain of truth in that. There's a... Giving the truth can be quite difficult as well, um, especially if anyone's been in the position of trying to give the truth to someone. So these are just a couple of tips I've had um, on, on ways to do that. I think one I find really useful is like sharing the story in my head. So I'll often lead a conversation with someone in my team um, or maybe even a partner. You know, the story in my head is that when you do this thing, you know, you're dismissing me or you're not making me feel valued or it makes me think you don't care about this. And putting it forward as a narrative that you can then discuss is, is sometimes much more helpful than just saying, I think you don't care, or, you know, I think you're arrogant, or I think you don't speak up. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of helpful ways to, to approach this conversation. So ego uh, is apparent in a whole bunch of different ways. I think there are kind of three layers to it as, a, as an organization. Um, it's important that you can't just isolate you can't just fix it at one specific bit. It's kind of across the whole spectrum of, of yourself all the way up to you know, your entire organization, which could be tens of thousands of people, or you know, more generally your, your department, and then even smaller, your team of five or 10 that you might work with. The key part here, and we're gonna talk initially about is self. And the biggest part around your ego here is, are you receiving the truth? You know, if you have a high ego, you're probably not receiving the truth from other people. They might be scared to give it to you, you might be kind of dismissing it or not seeking it. Um, so we're gonna dive a little bit more into that self piece. So the question you might be asking yourself is, um, do I have a big ego? You know, but I'm so, you may think, oh no, I don't have a big ego because you might be someone who's more insecure or you might be someone who knows they're kind of 
very like do and you think oh yeah I might do but I think that might not be a useful comparison the way I like to interpret having a big ego is are you someone who prefers comforting lies over sometimes unpleasant truths so when you get the truth it actually informs sort of reality um, and, you, and you're not letting your ego get in the way of what that truth is I like the I'll give an example of Ronaldo here some people might think that uh, he might be pretty egotistic. Um, I think a lot of people would probably make that, that uh, comment about him. The reason I think it's important is Ronaldo is one of the best players in the world. And one of the reasons why he is one of the best is he is incredibly seeking out the truth from coaches, uh, from his trainers and everything. It's, it's quite well known that he's someone who is um, obsessed with hearing the truth from his team about how he can get better. So he's incredibly high performing but he also is very desperate to hear the truth and get better. And I think in this context, he's someone who wouldn't be a big ego. Um, so I, I think that sometimes is quite an important distinction to make. You can be a very high performer, but also show a lot of humility and, and growth mindset. So outside of just yourself, whoop, got one. Um, there are a couple of building blocks I put here, Ryan, sort of what does it mean to be, uh, to, to get the truth? This also works for yourself, not just for a team. Um, and I've kind of laid them out in this format here because I think at the bottom of all of this is safety is so important to this. So it's one thing just to go and you know start giving the truth to someone, but if there is no psychological safety, and um, if you think back to the Columbia disaster, um, Rodney didn't feel safe to speak up. So this is a really huge topic, psychological safety. I'm not going to go into it a lot, but it kind of is very important to um, align people to kind of remove their egos and feel safe in doing so. Um, some of the other points in here are important are feedback has to be candid. And what that means is it has to have high empathy, but also high honesty. Transparency is important. If you're not putting anything out there, you're not going to get any feedback. You know, if you don't put your thoughts and, and points of views outside, or you don't put on the new clothes that you want to get feedback from your partner on, you're not going to get any feedback or truth on it. And lastly, rituals. So why do I use the term ritual? There's a lot of time when you might feel like you don't want to get feedback. You know, we've all been there and said, okay, you know, actually I've had a pretty rough week. I've had enough of feedback right now, actually. And it's very easy to opt out of hearing that truth. I mean, it's, it's super common. I, I feel like that a lot of the time. Rituals are something where if it's in, if it's ritualized and it's every week or it could be every day or every month, you can't really get out of it. It kind of forces you to go into um, that difficult situation sometimes and actually get that through. So rituals are quite important to that. Discipline is another way of thinking about it. So again, looking at the, from a team perspective, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the open kitchen model. So you may have noticed that a lot of restaurants these days actually show you the, the restaurant. You can look in when you're eating and see the chefs making the food. So why do they do this? The reason they do it is they want to show you they have an extremely high standard of making food. They're really proud of the food they make and they, they want to make that part of the experience. They want to make the making of the food great. And so the takeaway here is you really want to expose when you want to make great. So when we're talking about transparency, if you don't expose that thing, you're not going to make it awesome because you're not going to get any feedback on it. And it's not going to be exposed to get the truth. One way we do this at MaxJump, uh, taking this open kitchen model, there's a lot going on in this slide. So I've, if you just look on the right-hand side initially, is we have a thing called a 10X. Uh, it's actually taken from uh, American TV shows, sort of a lot of our stuff's American, hence the Navy stuff. Um, and essentially you have a presenter go up and they'll present on their work or, or multiple presenters will go up and present on a project or some engineering thing they've done. And then there are judges who are sort of senior members of the staff um, who will give feedback to that presenter. And then there's an audience watching this happen. There's some really key points in this though that make it different from what you might uh, initially think. One is that the primary is actually the audience, not the presenter, because they're learning from the judges one, how to give good feedback, and two, the judges' feedback is usually pretty good because they're sort of senior members of staff, they've been select, specially picked. And that feedback and truth can often apply directly to their projects, even if not they're not presenting. So the, the audience is really primary in this, and, and the presenter is almost uh, sort of just there as a person. One thing I like to think about this is we often say, you know, uh, praise in public, but criticize in private. Often that criticism, especially from someone senior, has a huge amount of value in it. 
And so if it's in private, no one else is getting that, that useful information. So in this uh, situation, everyone is getting that really useful feedback and, and, and uh, honesty and whatever it could be uh, as a, at scale. So this all probably sounds kind of difficult um, when I'm talking about the truth and I'm talking about giving each other feedback and it's candid. Um, it can be difficult having been in a culture where you do get a lot of feedback is, you know, we're all reptiles. We have lizard brains. Um, getting the feedback can be difficult sometimes. So one thing that I find is really important is oscillation between feedback, what we call development and growth and all that kind of thing, and recovery. Again, this is a really huge topic we could go into, but I find that oscillating between periods of high intensity of feedback and then stepping back, you know, um, reflecting on what I've learned, um, kind of recovering from that and, and, and pulling apart that feedback a little bit more before going back into it. It's actually a really useful way to just keep up this rhythm over a longer period of time. Often I'll see people go in, get a lot of bunch of feedback and think, I'm never doing that again because they haven't really oscillated. One way I find that's been uh, also a really good way to oscillate and, and step back and recover is through recognition. So what do I mean by recognition? So uh, the reason there are pigeons on this slide is that you may have heard of the, the Skinner box experiment where they got pigeons to essentially press you know, different colors and they would get rewarded based on what color they pressed. The point here is that what you incentivize drives behavior. So it, at NextGen, what we incentivize is people helping each other. We used to have incentivism where whoever made the, the best code or you know, signed the biggest sales deal, they would receive the, the biggest reward at the end of the year. But what that led to was essentially an ego culture. You know, people were lying, hiding, faking about how they did certain things in order to, to get that reward. One example is we had a guy called John and his team, and they made a really amazing product uh, one year. But, and then he won this $50,000 award at the end of the year in a big, we had, went to a big conference center, he got called up and the CEO was like, you've done an amazing job, uh, we wanna reward you. And we thought everyone would be like, oh, wow, fantastic, you know, well done, John. But the reality was the team were incredibly pissed off because he was a bit of a tyrant, you know, who really whipped his team, he was incredibly uh, mean. You know, he was giving the truth, but he wasn't necessarily making it safe for others to give it to him, which is very important. And so the takeaway from that story is, we changed how we did recognition to recognize those who help others. And that's really important, recognize those who help others. And that behavior of, of helping others, we call it gratitude, fosters more of that behavior. So, so now the, the, the award that we give out every year is uh, actually the Avengers Award, who helps other people the most. And also this really helps talking back about this oscillation is when you add this gratitude level um, into what you do, it could even be in your team, it doesn't have to be organizational level, um, adding that gratitude and, and um, recognizing that behavior is a really powerful thing. I can really help change behaviors. Um, just some really other kind of like ideas I wanted to put out there um, for thoughts we could talk about later is um, ways that we find transparency and, and things like that useful. Public code reviews and public design documents where you encourage everyone to read and, and um, give feedback to. We always start our meetings um, with kind of what people are worried about. We call it on my mind. So it can even be stuff not related to work, you know, so uh, it helps people start a, a vulnerable dialogue about, oh, you know, actually I'm a bit stressed because of something going on at home. And then the whole rest of the conversation becomes much easier because you, you kind of are aware of that. Um, junior to senior feedback giving, we often start at the most junior person. Otherwise the, the junior person just copies the senior person, especially if it's kind of an unsafe uh, situation. And another thing is really encouraging uh, ownership at the junior levels. So if you encourage uh, your junior staff to, to own things and go out and seek feedback, that'll really compound itself when they start moving through the leadership track. So the last thing I'm gonna leave you with uh, is a little bit of my own ego, um, in a situation where uh, I kind of really messed up and had a really big ego. So I think that'll uh, help add to the authenticity of this. So a couple of years ago, um, I was responsible for the fraud operations of our UK business. So we're an e-commerce platform. We do about 2 billion a year. Um, we're actually a very big target for credit card fraud. And so I made, it was a, I think it was a Thursday afternoon um, and I'd had a really good week. I'd, I'd uh, smashed a bunch of projects. I'd got some really good feedback from my boss and I kind of thought I was on top of the world. And I had this piece of code that I was changing um, about the fraud system. And I didn't get a code reviewed. I kind of thought, I know what I'm doing. You know, no one else really understands this. I'm kind of the expert here. 
And then it went to production and some tests failed. And I thought, oh, you know, it's just, I'll ignore that. I know what I'm doing. Um, I'm not reading the signal. I wasn't reading the signals. But it went to production and, and things did not go very well. But they didn't go well um, for a while. I didn't notice for a while because I was so sort of in my own head about how well I was doing. In fact, actually, I released that code and then went out that night. Um, this is a picture for me from a pub. I sort of questioned about putting this in, but I thought, why not? Um, this is me doing a, a tinfoil competition at our local pub um, that night. And as this was happening, um, we were losing a lot of money as a company, essentially. I'd essentially turned off all of our fraud protection um, for an entire night. So uh, this is an email um, I received from uh, in the morning. Um, essentially, we've lost over $100,000. Next Jump's going to uh, have to eat that entire cost. Um, and the root cause is James is working on implementing upgrades um, and a combination of his release and some other mistakes led to this. So I was essentially entirely involved in this. I then got an email from uh, our CEO, Charlie Kim, um, and it read this. And bear in mind, I'd kind of come in a bit foggy. You know, I'd had a couple of beers last night, and this was a really quick way to kind of suddenly feel very vulnerable, I think. And when I read this email, I felt like I was going to be fired. You know, I felt like this is it. This is kind of the end of the road um, in my career here. It's not okay. You know, you need to come clean immediately. And so I sat there, um, slightly hungover, but very sharp now. Um, and very humble. So I'm just going to share some of the takeaways I had from that that I then shared with the CEO and the senior team. Um, and I really went into some of the internal narratives that I had um, and tried to share as much truth as possible. Um, so, you know, I felt upset and scared that uh, I wouldn't be trusted in anything again. Um, I was frustrated at myself. There's a key part here in the second screenshot is that um, uh, uh, there's a combination of technical arrogance and laziness. And this sounds pretty similar to the um, Columbia disaster, actually, in some ways, obviously a uh, different impact, but technical arrogance and laziness, um, you could call that an ego. And so I wrote up all this takeaway and, and shared this and really kind of tried to be as honest and vulnerable as I could. And then uh, I received this email later on saying, James, appreciate you not lying, hiding, and faking those words again coming back. And I would share. So the takeaway here is that I think what was really important is the mess up I wasn't fired and it was used as a learning opportunity. So that, I think that's a really good example of psychological safety where um, I felt safe to come clean in some sense. And then we used it as a learning opportunity and shared it around the entire company. Everyone had to kind of read the, the takeaways and what had happened and saw I, anyone could have made those mistakes really at any, at any point. So this, is really, this was really um, a turning point for me in kind of checking my own ego, checking my own arrogance sometimes and really seeking feedback and truth from others earlier in the process. So if it's too long, didn't read. Um, here are some of the takeaways from it. Um, ego cultures essentially have low truth and this leads to bad decisions and essentially failure. All of this really starts with our own self-awareness and, and looking at ourselves internally about how, how often do we to receive the truth. Psychological safety is incredibly important no matter what sort of rank you are in that in the totem pole. If you don't feel safe to speak up, this, isn't, this whole thing isn't gonna work. Transparency by default, always being transparent with what you're doing and oversharing is something we encourage as a, as a way to encourage feedback. We find that adding feedback to your existing, you don't have to add new rituals, just start adding feedback at the end of uh, some of your existing work routines is a good way to kind of kickstart this and really ritualize it. So, you know, maybe do it once a week or, or if you have a stand up um, once a week or retrospective, you know, just bake it into that. But also as well as feedback giving, bake in recognition as well to, to sort of counterbalance it. And one thing we find is also don't go in and just change everything. You can only change 2% of the time. Um, this is from sort of biological theory. If you change more than 2% of, of an organism, it dies. So only change 2% of the time slowly and you'll see the, the impact of this. And that's everything I have. Um, I'd be really interested if anyone actually takes some of this advice and, and uses it themselves you know, in themselves or the team or anything. Um, I'm really curious to see how it goes and how you guys experience it. So feel free to email me, um, jhughesinaction.com and then we can chat and pick up the conversation there as well. Cool, that's everything I have. Amazing, James, thank you so much. I'm gonna ask everyone to unmute if that's okay. We'll show our appreciation. Thank you, James. Yeah.
occasionally we've got some barking dogs and uh, screeching cats as well showing their appreciation. Um, so we're going to uh, vamp. Uh, no, we're not going to vamp. Actually, we're, first of all, uh, we're going to do the q and I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so if people do have questions, uh, please do type them in uh, to the chat window and ask people to um, unmute. So we, we do have some questions in here. I'll ignore my questions that I put, that I put in there. Um, so Tony, Tony, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Tony, are you on? Are you on mute? Are you able to ask your question? Hi. Hi there. Am I coming through? Hey, how you doing? Good. Sorry, my headset, my other headset, didn't hold microphone. Uh, yeah, I was just interested if if you have any experience because if you've got a narcissist on the team they're not going to be very open to getting feedback and might react quite negatively it could also disrupt that cycle of getting feedback and create that you know you talked about getting that cycle of getting the team more towards receiving feedback and getting that more positive attitude and that could it be very disruptive if you've got any experience you know along those lines yeah, um, it's a really good question. We so we have a term internally for people who are kind of very smart but hard to work in a team. It's like a brilliant jerk. Uh, so it might be a useful phrase. Um, one thing that I find when dealing with um, people like that is often, especially if you're a manager or, or sort of maybe senior, um, and it's only one person giving that person feedback, they can tend to dismiss it quite easily. Um, what I find helpful is is actually trying to use people's peers. Um, and use their peers and people around them to not maybe not give them feedback, but maybe talk to them a little bit more. So it isn't just coming from one person. Um, and that can sometimes get through a little bit, um, through a little bit more, if that helps. And I think some of the other stuff on like sharing sort of, if you lead with vulnerability about how it makes you feel, that, that can often really open up a, a really sort of surprisingly productive conversation sometimes because that person may have loads of shit going on that you don't know about, you know, um, excuse my French, and often if you lead with that, it, it gives them the safety to open up, and all of a sudden you might realize, oh, this person might have, you know, stuff going on at home, or they might have, you know, all sorts of challenges that lead them to act that way, so that's mm -hmm. just a thing to think about. James, thank could, you. Could, could you explain what you mean by leading with vulnerability? Could you just kind of, yeah, put some meat on that? Sure, um, yeah, I mean, so I was actually, I was initially, I spent a lot of time in the military um, when I was at uh, university and, and kind of before that. And what I learned there was that to be a leader, I need to be very strong and show a lot of strength and, and kind of know that you have the answer all the time because everyone's looking at you. Um, but I think what I've learned since then is one of the most powerful ways to get people to, to inspire people and get people to listen to you and kind of bring people along with you is showing uh, weakness sometimes and showing vulnerability and that you don't know the answer to everything. So... To me, leading with vulnerability is about showing people that you know you're you're essentially opening a chink in your armor, um, and by doing that, it kind of brings the other person's guard down. Um, so you don't feel like you're coming at them all guns blazing. You're kind of bringing them with a peace offering, and offering yourself a little bit. It's like there's probably much better ways to describe it, um, but that's kind of how I imagine it in my head. Okay, no, that's, that's yeah, I think that explains it. Um, any other? questions from people. Um, I'm just flicking through the list here. Maybe one one from James. James O'Halloran, do you want to, uh, any, any advice, books, methods about how to ask for feedback? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, which actually somebody has already answered with the Radical Candor, the um, book by Kim Scott, which I've never actually mm -hmm. read, but have been recommended to me a few times. But, but for James, is there, like, Going up to someone and saying, have you got any feedback for me? Or, or you know, have you got it like at the end of an email or something like it's a little bit fraught because I think people equate that in their mind. They translate that in their mind to, oh, he's just sniffing for some praise. That's what mm -hmm. I've found, like certainly in my role. And I wonder if there's better questions than that, like just in the very initial kind of like, you know, when you, when you are looking, seeking to find the truth and you really want the candor, you're not just looking for some sort of um, stoking or praise. Uh, have you got any kind of way of approaching that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Actually, I could talk for a long time on that one. Um, I think I've, I think so. The first thing is feedback is a gift. I, I like to think of it that way. Like to give someone feedback actually takes a lot of effort, um, especially if it's kind of considered and thoughtful. And, and so even just understanding from that perspective, like when I give someone feedback, 
I see a lot of junior people doing that, especially as well. Like, give me feedback, give me feedback. Um, and so almost training people to realize that feedback is a gift, I think it is some, one thing that's important. Um, one thing that I've found to, to get reactions, um, that, that's how I sometimes call it, is I want to get reaction from someone. Um, so this isn't, you know, this might not be the best way of doing it, but personally, I find if I put something slightly more extreme, say if I'm sharing a point of view, I would sometimes maybe um, deliberately explore some of the extremes in that to, to actually get a reaction. Not, to, not like kind of offending anyone, but sometimes saying, you know, exploring more of the extremes of sharing that point of view. Um, but the other, the point around sniffing for praise is really interesting. I have to have a think about that one. I think that again depends on the culture with the rest. Of it. I think it can't really be fixed by like a how you sign off the email, but yeah, I can think of that. that's a good, a good question. Yeah, I have a ponder on that. I think um, we'll we'll vamp um, straight into the if, into the panel, and um, so I'd like to introduce a, a few more voices into the mix here. Um, so we have Martin Hogg, uh, who is senior development director, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. Uh, we have Kate Warden, who is the Senior Engineering Manager at Target and founder of Developer First, based in Minneapolis. Is that correct, Kate? Yep, Minneapolis. <laughs> hey. Um, and also James O'Halloran, who is uh, an executive coach uh, based uh, in Bristol. So perhaps maybe we should start at the you know, very personal level. I guess this, you know, this, this can work at many different levels, but maybe we should just start at um, sort of the, the, the personal level. Um, I'm just wondering how how do we engage with people to promote awareness of their behavioral patterns and how do we then change these behaviors? Does someone want to maybe, maybe tackle that? Maybe comment a little. Um, what I found is often the, the rising of a negative emotion, be it fear, be it anxiety, be it worry, um, the rising of that negative emotion is often a very, very powerful signal, um, both for somebody you're working with and for yourself. Um, and it's often a sign that either in them or in you, ego is kicking in. Um, so when I'm working with folks, uh, and you can sense it in yourself, you know, you're, you're, uh, uh, I'm conscious the panel's coming. And I'm like, I hope I don't make a dick of myself, right? There's the fear arising, and that's my ego, like hoping that my ego comes out of this engagement un, un, unattacked and, and intact, right? So that negative emotion rising um, with folks I work with, folks in my team and folks in other teams, um, whenever I, I kind of sense that in myself or in others, um, there's often like a deep sort of coaching opportunity there. Um, and that, you know, for me, there's almost like, I don't know if you're aware of that, that, that there's that coaching performance for a performance book and the guy talks about arc awareness responsibility and commitment mm -hmm. nothing will change without awareness and first you need awareness and when you have awareness then you need to take responsibility and then you need to make a commitment for change so almost i think the first thing is that that awareness of when ego is present um, for me that negative emotion is is such a powerful signal that most of us especially in the kind of i work for an american company right where you're meant to like brush that to one side and be like the alpha executive and, and tell everyone what to do, right? So in, in that culture, actually recognizing that emotion is almost um, almost like a, seen as a weakness, right? So, so helping like folks around you understand that actually that is one of the most powerful signals you have available to you. Like when you sense that, don't dismiss it. Um, that, that's, that's something I've found has worked uh, well over the years. There's an internal listening. You're, there's a, you've got to get used to it to listening to these signals and being aware of these of these signals. Yeah, and it's almost a physical thing. It's almost a body thing. You, yeah. I, I, when I use the phrase, you feel it rise. It it, it actually feels like there's there's almost a connection, you know, a, a, a deep sort of physical body thing. So, so James Owen, in your work with with your with your clients, pres presumably. It, this is sort of coaching 101 is it in, in, in terms of the, you know that art model that, that martin was talking about yeah yeah I, I wouldn't even say it's coaching 101 because actually it can, it can take quite a while to get to this place with some people and and for me the way i language it but i'm talking about exactly the same thing as martin but the way i language it is turning up the volume on your intuition 
like I think we all have like a, an aspect that's often physical as you say like it, it can be a gut response or that's the way we often think about it but other people experience it differently but you know that kind of gut reaction that you know oh something's not quite right here or, or whatever it may be and, and and for me with my clients so I typically work with tech entrepreneurs and what, what I'm trying to do is is get them to cultivate that tool if you like or get them to kind of like discover more about it like what it's what the sensation is like rather than um recognize it as like a pang to you know that i need another coffee or, or whatever like you know it's it's actually it's an instrument and, and there's a massive connection between you know your your gut and your brain and so if it is a gut response that you're feeling like the, you know the, the vagus nerve like there's a massive connection there and really what i'm trying to do is help people you know crank up the volume on that and sense into it because as an entrepreneur making decisions all the time like if you're shooting from the hip which often you are like you want to be able to tune into your gut and i think you know martin is deploying it in a different way there perhaps but but ultimately the same is true like there, there is a there is an answer um coming from your body if you're kind of patient enough or, or can step back and, and tune in and listen to it um, that's a good point because you're, you're saying that there's there should be an, an embodiment um, and and, if, and if the, fee, the feeling comes through the body rather than through the mind. Um, and I was just wondering uh, to bring Kate Kate in here. Uh, in your sort of uh, leadership training, um, do, is it is it quite is, is there an embodiment practice to it as well, or is it is it mainly looking at the you know, the mind and, and the mind's reactions to things? Yeah, this is like the first time I've kind of heard some of these concepts. So I really appreciate this perspective i'm taking notes as much as i can hear over my dog barking i'm sorry <laughs> um no it, yeah it's definitely more the mind and like the really intentional role of a leader to work with a team member on like delivering that feedback and then taking accountability for working with that person to help them get there um so i love this idea of like spending you know like on, on kind of the other way here um but I think like before any really, if we're just thinking about feedback in general, any really valuable feedback can come into play. It does take that like trust from the individual to the person who is giving them that feedback or coaching them, whether it is, you know, you, you know, you're just a, a perfect, like literally a professional coach and teaching these fundamentals or that really like effective trust. Like I, you know, that camaraderie, like I've worked with you before I can, you know, I, I feel close to you, like that type of thing. Um, that as a, a manager of people, you know, I'm trying to work to gain both so that then they trust me as I'm delivering this feedback. So I'm not only making the connection, the relationship with that person so that I can display, like I genuinely care about you improving and therefore I'm delivering this, you know, feedback that might be hard to hear right now, but I, I do it because I, I care about you and, you know, connecting that way. But then also, you know, they trust me because they trust my abilities and they've, you know, you know, seen me perform. Um, whereas I think that is achieved, you know, in this professional coach arena, um, whereas, you know, building that camaraderie and stuff is, is also important. Because hmm. you're saying that the, so the, the role of the, the intentional role of leader is to, to give the feedback, mm -hmm. um, I guess, but presumably it's about the, the person being able to, to hear that feedback. Yeah. In a judgmental way and then do, and then act on that. So you're, you're asking actually quite a lot of an individual even when you're giving you know negative negative feedback yeah yeah exactly and it, and that's where i i think it's important for people to like study this i mean some of the stuff that martin and james were saying is like that's a huge like step up if you can fundamentally understand and be very self-aware to say like okay yeah this is going to help me improve and i can you know, take accountability and um, understand what this person is getting at. Like that is also required first. So I've never taken this approach at, at feedback. So I'm mm. learning a lot here. Okay. One thing I find actually just to, just to touch on some of those themes is um, we, talk, we talk a lot about self-awareness um, and I think getting to self-awareness is difficult as an individual and also trying to get your team to self-awareness. Um, one thing that I find can sometimes help is um, as their coach is sometimes, especially if you're someone's coach or manager, you can sometimes put them in situations that can be pushed, like pushing for that person. Um, and when I say situations, I mean like, we call it like practices here, um, but like we might get some like organize, you know, a Halloween party over Zoom, right? And we'll give that to the junior member of staff. And it, it is almost, it's like a simulated stressful situation. And in that situation as the coach, you're almost there observing kind of, oh, you know, 
you notice when this thing happens, this is like a trigger for you. So, and then over the, the other important thing about that practice is it's always very safe. So it's we call it above the waterline. Like it's if they if they mess up the the Halloween party, it's not a big deal. You know, the company will be fine. Um, but as a coach, I find when I'm taking someone through that, I'd be like, hey, you know, you when these things happen, like I'm trying to think of an example, you know, when there's like a senior person gives you a point of view, you tend to like really panic and switch to that, you know, and you like drop your own point of view, or you know, you really tend to argue even when it's like everyone's against you, you know, you're making those kinds of things. Um, and even pointing those out to those people. It's like, oh shit, I didn't realize. And then if you start doing it on multiple occasions and you start connecting the dots for them, I find sometimes connecting dots for people, that's kind of when the penny drops in multiple situations. Um, and that can help kind of kickstart some of that self-awareness. And but I think as a coach, you have to kind of lean into it, that lean into that uncomfortability sometimes. And that's the hardest part I find is. Do you, do you think that a manager can be a coach? You're using those sort of two things interchangeably, manager and coach. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's an interesting dynamic. I think it, it can be difficult to balance that. I think what can be difficult, I've seen go wrong before, is trying to be a coach and a friend. That can sometimes go wrong because, you know, sometimes with my friends who are outside of work and outside of this context, I wouldn't necessarily be totally candid with them, you know, because that's just not sort of socially. But it, it, in our environment, you can still be friends with someone, but I think that's one distinction I would make. Um, as a manager and a coach, they tend to be, the one difficulty there is the feedback's coming from one person. That's really the biggest challenge I've seen with it. So having a separate coach and a manager can help because they're two different perspectives in the same person. So you get more broader, you know, I have my own biases and how I interpret people's actions from my own, how I've grown up. So having other people there can help. But then the benefit of it is because I'm managing that person, I can get all the data points. Like I'm, I'm aware of pretty much their entire world. Mm. I see how they act in loads of different situations versus just the small ones that I'm there coaching them in, um, which is why we do it that way. Um, but there are drawbacks to that, you know. And I was, I was wondering, J James O'Halloran, do, do you think that external coaching is therefore valid? Because then you're getting an external view uh, rather than just another another potentially biased internal view. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll be doing myself out of a job if I said anything other than yes. <laughs> Go on, sell yourself. Yeah. Sell yourself. <laughs> <laughs> just my moment to shine. Now. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to touch on something that James just said there a second ago. So, and it was a great question, Nick, about you know, can you be a coach and a manager in the same role? I think I. I think, you know, there's Daniel Goldman's model of leadership, which one of his kind of styles styles of leadership is actually a coaching style. And me as a, as a coach, like when I manage people or work with people, I take a coaching style. That's how I get the best out of people. That's what I know. So, but I think when you're a manager, you can do both. Not everyone can, but some people can do both. But I think what really helps is if you have different meetings for them that are also potentially in different places. So the context shifts and, and then it's a cue for the, for the um, person you're managing that when you go into this environment, you know, coffee every Friday morning or every like once a month on a Friday morning is always a wandering coaching type conversation about my personal development. It's never going to be the manager saying, have you got that done yet? Have you got this done yet? Like, I think the context shift, you can work really well. That's one question, but yeah, I mean, external coaching, like, you know, I guess it's all about objectivity, right? It just kind of brings in a fresh perspective, which, is unbiased from the organization, although the organization might be paying your, you know, your con the consultant's wage or the coach's wage, but um, it's, you know, the, the whole kind of idea there is that you're distant, you're not, you're kind of, you're outside of the culture. So there might be something like, the, like the culture of James's organization sounds incredibly mature, but you know, that not all organizations are like that. So often when I coach people in an organization in a culture that's maybe a little bit caustic you're able to actually normalize it with them so so I think you know and then they then they're inspired maybe to kind of oh it's not just me ah okay you know I've talked this through with someone else who's totally distant uh, you know and now I can bring this back in with confidence to my boss that yeah it's a bit weird around here you know we don't give anyone feedback or whatever it may be so mm -hmm. I, yeah of course of course objectivity I think is is helpful because yeah this is this is all happening within an organizational context and and i guess that's that's the key thing that you know one thing we're talking about here is the tech culture and you're establishing a tech culture in an organization uh but um martin maybe you can speak to this because presumably in a in a very large distributed global organization culture is inconsistent it, you know it's it's just not possible to have a consistent culture 
Wow, that is a good question. Um, it's it's definitely it's definitely hard to maintain the culture as an organisation scales. And in fact, Oracle is really interesting from a cultural perspective because about five years ago, we hired three people from like Amazon and Microsoft and Google and set them up in a building and said, "Go build a brand new organisation from the inside out with a different culture." Right, so kind of saw a new culture grow inside an existing organization. Mm -hmm. And what that organization did is actually defined some core values, uh, one of which is own without ego, and another one of which is don't be a jerk, <laughs> which I think are two of the points that were made earlier. And own without ego is really, um, the notion there is you, you, you must take responsibility for getting things done as a team, as an individual, but you have to be able to let go. You know, um, and the very act of letting go of something actually frees up and frees you up to go and fill another space that might be more business pertinent. So the notion of having core values. Now you hear people talk about core values and vision and often it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah we've got some core values. They're written down over there. Nobody ever looks at those things. Um, our recruitment process actually tests for core values. So I think somebody was asking earlier, how do you interview for Eager? I can't remember who that was. Uh, we actually have a list of like core values for the organization, act and iterate, um, nail the basics, own with that ego. And um, in the interview loops we do, each of our interviewers gets a couple of core values that they're specifically looking for evidence of behaviors of those core values. So that's a strategy to try and retain a culture. Um, but I think that's kind of culture almost with a small c. I think something Kate was saying about People know if you're acting in their best interests or not, and you can't fake it. If you genuinely care for the person that you're working alongside, be they a boss, a peer, somebody in your you know, somebody in your team, um, that's a much deeper connection, and that I think enables you to actually really like get a times ten, times a hundred level of growth for you and for the person you're working with. And that, for me, is culture with a big C. Um, and if you can establish those kind of relationships, and often it grows a bit like, um, yeah, when you see a crystal kind of grow in it, and it grows out, and often it goes point to point to point to point. Uh, I did some mentoring with somebody in California who's now mentoring folks in his team um, on, the, on the deeper kind of, you know, that deeper sort of feeling the emotion, really letting the ego go in the kind of Eckhart Tolle sense of ego death. Um, mm. so that you can really connect with the reality that's going on. And when you do that, um, you're actually operating with a clarity of information that most people don't have almost all the time because most people are wondering about like what they're going to say next or mm. what just happened like an hour ago and, oh, that meeting was terrible. And, um, so I think there's, there's yeah, I can, see, I can see the organization attempting to maintain a culture with a small c, and that is working to some degree uh, at a scale of like 6,000 engineers. Um, but at a smaller scale, um, my, I see the magic in those one-to-one -one relationships and that really deep, the deep trust. And, that, and you can't do that if you don't genuinely care. Mm. If you don't it's genuinely care, it just shows, right? Right. And, and that, that caring is the authenticity uh, of, of caring. And, and people can sniff out their authenticity pretty, you know, pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah, they can spot all the fake body language and all that, right? It's just like it's built into us as humans to know whether the, somebody we're interacting with really cares about us or not. Yeah. And Kate, I was just wondering, does, does that resonate with, with you mm -hmm. in, uh, in Target? Is that, you know, culture with a big or little C? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I think... And Target is so much about culture with the capital C, <laughs> you know, that's a big selling point as we're recruiting and, and all of that. And I've been on, it, it's so fascinating because I've been on several different teams now at Target and there's always like a general, like consistent feeling, even if you go into it, I don't know if anyone has traveled to the United States and been into a Target store, like it is just that like super collaborative, bubbly, exciting, like culture that, you know, is, 
it's fun to talk about, but it's not really, in my opinion, what matters, you know? Um, and I think going to the interviewing, I think it's like near, unfortunately near impossible to hire for ego and thinking about that. Um, kind of to Martin's point, like there's just it, culture to me is like, like these minuscule moments over time with a group, like individual humans. And so it, I think culture at, like at a team level is about all of those individual people coming together and what they bring and, and how they act. And then organizationally, it's again about all those same humans coming together. Um, so if like, as I attempt to interview, I'm asking questions, you know, to kind of talk about vulnerability, like tell me about a time where you failed and what you learned from that. Like if someone can't speak to that, then I, you know, know they're either, you know, not authentic or not choosing to share that for whatever reason, which isn't okay. You know, in our culture, that doesn't align with our culture. Cause we want to be able to talk about what we failed, you know, and, and stuff like that. So I can't remember what your initial question was, but I hope that helps. Yeah. I was just wondering whether the, you know, the, the culture of the big C resonated with Target. It sounds like it, it, it does. Would, would you say that the culture itself is a business strategy? Yes, for us, because we are um, so invested in de like literally developing products that spark that joy. Like we sell, pro you know, clothes and, merchandise that sparks that joy and so without that we wouldn't have a differentiator when it comes to walmart or amazon like people like going to a target store and shopping out or at least we like to think so <laughs> yeah and and uh, james i i know that um next jump perhaps um would would say that the you know the, the culture is has competitive advantage um and and that's that's featured in the in the everyone culture book do you do you want to just sort of say something about that perhaps yeah i mean um Culture is our number one business strategy. That's kind of, that's what it says in the tin, really. Um, and that's very clear in our recruitment. It's actually how we recruit. Like that, that's the thing we, that's the thing we say in all the recruitment stuff. And um, it's a hard pitch sometimes, especially we mostly hire grads. Um, so it can be a bit of a tricky pitch because what's culture? Um, but I think really buying people into the idea of like self-awareness like resonates with some people. Um, but yeah, culture, culture for us is our, our number one. Thing because people, I think, I didn't go into it, but I, there's a whole model about the 20th versus 21st century businesses and to succeed in the 21st century, people are more important than processes. So 20th century, is, the education is all set up like, can you answer these questions you've been taught? It's all very rote learning versus 21st century is about like navigating, like, kind of like the example of the sonar, so you've got to navigate these changing environments. So for us, it's a business strategy because we think if you don't adapt to that new way of operating, like being able to read the truth and being able to get feedback rapidly, you're not really going to survive as an organization. So at least that's what we think. <laughs> you could be wrong, but that's kind of a thought. Um, do you do you think that um, as a as, as an industry with you know within the software industry, it has a bit of a, a problem in this regard? Is it uh, is it unique? Uh, in the sense that it's, it's it's more perhaps more problematic than other industries with with a lack of awareness. I think I, I would I would argue the opposite actually in terms mm -hmm. of I think the reason why there's been so many successful disruptors is because you have organisations who software gives you the ability to real time understand if something's working or not. And I think that the benefit of like data, the benefit of like you know yeah data essentially you can read like if your app's being downloaded right now versus you know more traditional models. You know, you could build a hotel and it takes two years and then you have to hope that someone comes versus now, you know, you can build an app and see people downloading it. You can literally, you know, whether it's sort of ethical or not, you can record their face and see what they're looking at. So I think that's what's actually propelled the growth of these disruptor industries is the ability. It's kind of tangential to ego, but the ability to read the truth and get feedback very quickly. Um, and so applying that process to people as well, not just like your tools, um, I think is kind of the crux of what this is all about really i think okay. um i think the industry in general has became a lot more accessible to people who wouldn't be able to get into it before like all the you know free online boot camps and classes that you can take to learn how to code like that that was not the case before like you would need to get this like flashy shiny four-year degree to be able to get into computer science um so i think it's it's of being a lot more approachable um, and accessible has has helped that ego culture in, in my experience. There's still egos. I, I think all of us, I think <laughs> the, the takeaway here is that all of us can can show this, but it like, depends on what our triggers are. But we all certainly have an ego. And I think I'm not trying to say that, you know, there are, I'm perfected by any means. I certainly every day struggle with it. Um, 
yeah, I just, yeah, I hope that's not a takeaway. <laughs> so I'm saying I don't have an ego. You know, we all do. So we're, we're, we're fast running out of time. I wonder if um, th there's anything burning um, that um, any, anyone would like to add or any other sort of nuggets of, uh, of insight. James, any, any James or Helen, any, any reflections on, on some of that? No, I just think it's it's incredible. I'm just so inspired by by kind of listening to the story, James, of of your organization and and how you're going about things as well. Like it just, oh, I just I would love to think that I could be surrounded by people in my workplace where they will tell me the truth and that is okay. Like that just seems like quite far away. I mean, I, I work in my own little organization of one, so I kind of give myself the truth. But uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, I mean, like yeah. I mean, James, do, do, do you want to reflect on that? Do, do you think Next Jump is actually a bit of an anomaly right now? Uh, yeah, yes, hopefully not. So one of our missions as a company is to change the world by changing workplace culture. Um, so hopefully we, we, hopefully, this will start to change, um, but obviously it's going to be a slow process, I think. But I mean, the other thing I would say is, you know, we are, we are experimental culture and we get a lot of stuff wrong as well. Um, you know, we, we run experiments and we try things and, and some things just don't work, you know, and piss people off and, you know, we try. I think when you're doing experimental stuff, it doesn't always work. Um, but I think the key point is like the intention, you know, if like this is your intention, you really want to do it, then I think everyone kind of goes along with it. Um, but everyone, I think the reason why I'm here is because I just enjoy working with people who are so candid and care about you, you know. And, uh, Radical candor is a term. I think someone mentioned that book already, but it's such a useful term. Like surrounded by people with radical candor is really kind of helpful for your growth. Well, maybe one thing we can do is, is maybe pull some of the resources um, and, and, and share them uh, afterwards. I think that'd be, a, so if anyone has suggestions for, uh, you know, other books that haven't been mentioned or other, you know, uh, methodologies or practitioners uh, unfortunately, we, Martin, we didn't have a chance to talk about Bob Marshall or uh, you know, Bob Keegan at, at Harvard. Um, but we unfortunately going to have to leave it there. So thank you so much, James. That's been really interesting food for thought. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Kate, for uh, joining us from Minneapolis. And, uh, and thanks, thanks to James uh, Halloran. So I'd just like to uh, finish up um, by saying that all of our content is recorded. Uh, if you'd like to, to catch up on some of the previous events, then please do have a look at bridge.tech forward slash videos. I'm about to post the ones from the last um, few weeks, um, so they'll be up shortly. The next event is going to be in a month's time. Um, it's going to be uh, Ruby on Rails, so Mark Smith from Storm is joining us. And uh, we are really, really proud and pleased of all of the sponsors for 2021. So thank you to GoCo Group, to Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, the Storm Consultancy and to Ovo Energy for, for making this happen. And um, thank you very much um, for joining us and hopefully we shall see you in, in next month. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Nick. Thanks, Nick. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye-bye. Thanks,